You're listening to the Mind Flipping Podcast, where you'll find tools and tips to help you renovate and update your mind and life. Dr. Steve, thanks so much for being on the Mind Flipping Podcast. Hey, Rick. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you. Um, you know, I, I got to tell you, one of the things that I really admire about you and I'm grateful to you for is your success and the fact that um, you've made in as much as it can be hypnosis kind of accepted and, mid, and mainstream, if you will. What do you feel about that? Is it accepted mainstream or even at, you know, uh, how long you've been doing it, you get a little bit of the eye roll if you talk to people about it? Yeah, people are still suspicious, uh, and mainly that's because there's no standardization of credentialing uh, nationwide like in America. That there, there may be some in other countries. I'm, I'm not aware of it actually. But uh, one of the things I was working, I was focused on when working on my doctorate in education is the idea of getting that standardization of credentials so that you know when you go to a hypnotherapist in New Jersey, they're going to be doing the same, they're going to provide you with the same standard of care as one in California, for example. But uh, we really don't have that until we have that. Even acupuncturists have that. Even, uh, you know, chiropractors have that, but we don't. Hmm. Um, so that's still, you know, a bit of a hurdle. But I do think that over the years, there are so many hypnotherapists now that, it's not just, I, I'm not hearing the, so I'm not hearing so much the statement I used to hear a lot, which is, wow, I've never met anybody who does that before. Uh, so now, now I'm, I'm hearing that less and less because they are meeting people who have done that before. And that's, that's good to know. Yeah. On, on that note, I, I look forward to the day where, you know, there are people who at Starbucks that you can hear them talking about, well, my, my coach or my life coach says this, and I look forward to the day where it's, common for them to say my my hypnotist or my hypnotherapist or my mind coach you know yeah yeah i think it will uh it will potentially happen one day we're not there yet but uh yes that would be nice that would be nice um so as you know the mind flipping podcast is about all of us our guests and our listeners uh renovating and updating their their minds and then their lives do you have a um a, first of all i guess a, a personal mind flipping story times where you've recognized you needed to change the way you were thinking uh, that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I first moved to Las Vegas, I put on, uh, put on some extra weight. I put on 30 pounds and I had to do something about that. Here I am, the guy who's teaching people with hypnosis about how to uh, lose weight and get everything together. And I was, you know, I'm a fairly thin guy, but I was getting a, a pot belly. So, you know, the, the middle-aged pot belly and it was being exacerbated by the nonsense food I was eating on the strip. So I, uh, I hired a dietitian and a trainer. And uh, I also started using my own medicine, my own hypnosis audios and had to flip my mind and, and, and get it on the right track. And since then, I've been able to lose 30 pounds and keep it off for, uh, you know, it's been about a year and a half that I've, that I've had that off now. And it was just a matter of uh, retraining myself and, you know, creating new associations. Uh, that food is not good for you. This food is. And there are other ways to have pleasure besides eating food that's not good for you. So that's, that's my mind flipping story. I love it. And uh, as somebody who just came from Vegas, in fact, you and I met for the first time there in Vegas within yeah. the, the last week, uh, I could see how it would be easy to, to put on the, the pounds in Vegas. Oh, so easy. I mean, just the, the food is so, it, it's great. And they have some of the best chefs in the world have restaurants here. So, I mean, if you, I'm not, I don't consider myself a foodie, but I also wasn't even, I wasn't consciously thinking about what I was doing. I was like, that tastes good. That tastes good. Oh, wow. That chef's food is really good. And then next thing you know, I had a situation on my hands. So I, I took care of that. 30 pounds later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you're around that much good food, there's a sense of uh, you want to take advantage of it and they don't traditionally typically serve small portions. And so you want to I take advantage of all of it. And yeah, I mean, American portions are, are huge. We're, we're known for that. And uh, that's what tourists want. And that's, um, I guess, what I wanted. I guess the first couple of years I was here, I was essentially a tourist, as everyone kind of is when they first moved to a new place. So I fell into that, that lot and uh, had to rescue myself from it. Excellent. So as you look back, is there, was there an awareness uh, that you 
came to that you weren't aware that kind of really helped you, um, whether it's portion control or the types of foods, that, you know, and whether it was your own self-suggestion or something that your dietitians or trainers told you? Yeah, it was really uh, this, uh, the gym I go to, uh, where I live, there's a gym and there's a, a lady there who's uh, in, in outstanding shape, you know, really thin and works out all the time. And she said to me, abs are made in the kitchen. And I thought, hmm. you know, and it, it's true when you look at the research and, and then having lived the research now and having lost the weight, it, most of it's diet, you know, very little of it's exercise, very little weight loss is exercise. Most of it's diet, what you put in your mouth, you got to reduce that. So um, that was uh, a breakthrough for me. I had been teaching this kind of stuff for years, but it's, it's completely different when it's, you know, your belly fat that you're talking about. It's, uh, you just look at it differently and you get new insights into it. Yeah. And it's one thing to know it. Um, but when I, when your life situation changes, you, your metabolism changes, I know for me, I'm, you know, luckily I've got good genes and I was born pretty thin, but there came a time where I couldn't eat what I used to eat and you have to relearn and reprogram. And Yeah. I mean, when I was uh, 20, if I had eaten this way, it probably would have gone right away. But the little, uh, you know, the, the older you get that, uh, yeah, metabolism does slow down, the game changes and you have to adapt. Yeah. So you mentioned something that uh, made me think of a conversation I had recently with one of uh, my uh, students, hypnotherapy students, um, talking a little bit about her reluctance to get into the business because she said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, I, 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 I've got too many things I need to work on on my own. And so you said, you know, you're here you were, you know, a uh, hypnotherapist uh, and recognize there were a few pounds and it makes sense that we would want to take care of our own home, if you will. But what do you say to those who are getting into the business that hold off because there are things that they aren't fixed yet? You know? I say don't give yourself that excuse uh, because when I lived in Savannah, Georgia, one of the best marriage and family therapists, well, he wasn't an MFT, that's a credentialing in California mainly, but one of the best therapists that I knew who worked with families and keeping couples together, he had been divorced five times. Uh, you know, I've met people who are really good at teaching weight loss who are overweight. So I say don't give yourself that excuse. We're all human. And as they say, the mechanic's car is always broken because he's fixing everyone else's car. And that's okay. Um, I haven't always been, uh, you know, right now I'd say I pretty much got it together. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm walking the talk and uh, I'm, you know, living what I, what I preach but it hasn't always been that way in every category of my life for humans. So uh, the, the fact that you have something going on with you does not have anything to do with the help that you can give someone else. I agree. Kudos. Excellent. You know, and that's kind of what I told her. I said, you know, uh, if you have a gift to share, a gift of just facilit facilitating change within somebody else, why keep that just because you are still facilitating your own changes? Yeah, there you go. I like it. Yeah. Excellent. I like how you said that. Don't give yourself that excuse. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times that's what it is. They're, they're really just afraid of, of doing that or, or they're afraid they'll get judged. They make it about themselves. It's not about them. It's about the people they will help. And so if you kind of get, get over yourself and realize that it's about them and not you, then, you know, life becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Flip from the inward to the outward focus. and. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge, especially in advertising. You know, you see all these people, uh, especially the YouTube things. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Well, people aren't interested in, in anyone other than themselves for the most part. So they want to know what you can do for them, yeah. not, not what you're doing for yourself. So, uh, yeah, I think if people keep that in mind, then things like being overweight, uh, you know, that doesn't matter. As long as you can make them thin, they're fine with that. Yeah. Yeah, and... Uh for hypnotherapists that, you know, uh, to your point, maybe uh, are overweight and are holding back on helping others. That's not the hypnotherapist decision. That's their client, you know, and don't make that decision for them. They might not care. Yeah. I mean, if they see an overweight hypnotherapist, they think, oh no, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, fine. Well, but the data will speak for itself. You know, I helped so-and-so lose weight. I helped so-and-so lose weight. I have testimonials. You know, obviously I know how to use the tools I have the tools, so, you know, you decide. So if somebody's going to write you off because of that, that probably will happen. But for the most part, I think people look at 
what you can do for them, not what you can do for yourself. Yeah. That number one radio station, W I I F M, right? There you go. It's everyone's favorite. They're tuned in all the time. Yeah. What's, what's in it for me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So I know a lot of your background uh, is in uh, one on one um, private sessions, it's in training others, it's in uh, your extensive library of, of books that you've authored uh, over 20. Uh, books and all of the uh, into thousands of audios. Am I right? Yeah, I run about 9,000 hypnosis audios now. I applied to the Guinness Book of World Records for the record because I thought, well, this is just the facts. You know, I, I have the, the record, but they said there's no way to verify that somehow. So I wasn't able to make it official, but, but yeah, I've been busy. Yeah. So of all of that, um, what mind flipping stories stand out, whether it was a a testimonial that somebody listened to some of your audios or some of your students or even your one-on-one -on -one clients. Any stories you'd like to share? Yeah, I have a story that's near and dear to my heart, which is a lady named Jen who came to me and it must have been, oh goodness, going on 10 or 15 years ago now. And uh, she was suicidal. She was overweight and she was about 180 pounds over her ideal weight. So not 180 pounds, but 180 pounds over her ideal weight. So she was she was uh, healthy, as they say, and yeah. she wanted to lose that weight. She came with her mom. Uh, she was going to kill herself. She was going to end it all because she didn't, you know, just a lot of things were going wrong and the weight was just a physical manifestation of everything that was for her, of everything that was going wrong. Uh, her mom brought her there, sat with her through the sessions, which I'm always fine with as long as the client's okay with that. And uh, went through a few sessions with her. I do a weight loss protocol of of five sessions and then we I didn't hear from her for a long time and I thought oh my goodness you know I hope Jen's okay because some clients really stick in your mind and your heart and then I got a letter from her uh, a while later it was I forget how long ago it was now but it was like uh, maybe a year later she had lost a whole bunch of weight uh, she was feeling great she had married the man of her dreams which her in her dreams is a I think a six foot one architect and she had a I think a kid and a kid on the way. It was a handwritten letter. You don't you don't see that very often, and uh, you know it's a it's a testimonial to people's durability and their their desire to move forward no matter what and and ultimately not give up. That's awesome. Boy, just hearing it, especially the handwritten letter, kind of gave me goosebumps because that's what I've gotten some of those, and that's what we do this for. You know, uh, right. that impact. That's very cool. The thing that you said you know, about this story, and, and I'm sure you can relate, and it's the reason that you continue to do it, is when clients come to me in the, a situation perhaps similar to Jen's where they're down and out and don't see uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And, and at times I'll share with them that um, I have confidence in what I do because I have confidence in their mind. And, and mm -hmm. even when they don't see it, we're, we're designed to grow and learn and change. And that's what she did, which is Awesome. Yeah, there you go. That's what it's all about. I, I believed in her and that helped her believe in herself. And I think she already believed in herself, of course. But, you know, sometimes people need a little, little push in the right direction. And uh, that's where I came in. I was honored to be part of that journey. Yeah. So looking back to you, remember any uh, little light bulbs uh, going, any ahas in your sessions with her that you think maybe really tipped her over? Or, or was it, were you a little surprised when you got the letter? I was, I was surprised when I got the letter. I don't recall any of the details of the sessions per se. And most of the sessions that I do are just me talking and them listening, you know, them in hypnosis and me talking yeah. after I find out some preliminary stuff about what's going on with them each week when we check in. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was fairly, it was a surprise to me because that was an extreme case. Yeah. And uh, I have very few extreme cases like that. And so I, I was I was very pleasantly surprised because when I hadn't heard from her, I, you know, I didn't know what to think. Yeah. I think all of the, uh, hypnotherapists, hypnotists, coaches, um, listening, have those clients where you think about them later and you wonder how they're doing and, and uh, right. to, to get a note or an email is fantastic. Yes. In fact, uh, 30 minutes ago, I just got off the phone with a client that had emailed me two days ago and had just shared, uh, it was a stressful day and listened to a couple of the audios and I just wanted to let you know, he said it, it, it made my day better. And okay. uh, yeah, yeah, we just chatted uh, about a half hour ago. So those are what nice. we, those, that's why we do this. 
Absolutely. So it was all about helping yeah. people. So that's a, that's an, awesome and powerful uh, one-on-one client session. But really what I love about what you do, Dr. Steve, uh, for, for the industry is all of these audios that you've put out and the fact that you've been doing it for so long is proof you've been providing really awesome value. Nobody lasts as long as you do uh, <laughs> without providing value. Agreed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, eventually you'll get you know, washed out you know, with anything, you know, if, uh, you know, people, go, it, it's funny because a lot of people now are getting into hypnosis, but I think they're, they're, they're seeing the money, you know, they see me like on millionaire matchmaker or, or what have you. And they say, Oh, wow, that's, you can make a lot of money with that, but you know, that doesn't have any durability. And also you see people, uh, looking for publicity, you know, I'm going to get on this show or that show and the, the seeking publicity thing, is really not the way it works. If you're doing an outstanding job, publicity will seek you. So that that's what gives people durability is the fact that they're actually doing the work and doing a good job and they actually care about people. Yep. And I think that comes through in all of your work and in your audios. And that's why uh, you've lasted and, and have had a great success. Um, so on that note, on those uh, audios, you know, there's a I have clients that will ask me, uh, you know, can this really make a difference? You know, do I need to see you every time? And, um, and of course it can, you know, and, and you're proof of it. Do you have any uh, uh, stories of people that have emailed you or called you about from just buying audios, listening to those that have had changes in their lives? Oh, sure. Yeah. I have a lot of testimonials. I put them on my website, but uh, we, the ones that they allow me to, yeah. but uh, yeah, we, we get those, uh, quite often, you know, people saying, thank you, it, it helped me change. And, you know, really it's about them. They, they were ready to change. They just needed a, maybe an excuse to change, maybe an external representation of their change, like an audio they're listening to. And uh, so it's really, it's really about them, but uh, they, they do thank me, which is, which is very sweet of them. Yeah, that's very cool uh, that you played a part in it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and as you were talking about the millionaire matchmaker, yeah, I'm, uh, comes back to that question I asked about, do we need to get everything right in our lives before we can help others? And Patty, uh, um, St- St- is it Stang- Stanger? Stanger? Stanger. Stanger. Thank you. S-T-A-N-G-E-R. Um, and I know she didn't, she uh, struggled on the relationship end for a while. Any, uh, do you have an update? Is she uh, in a relationship now? I haven't talked to Patty in a few months. She, uh, she emailed me a few months ago. I don't know if she's currently in a relationship, but uh, you know, I, I think that people who are are working on that are finding resources for that, and sometimes those resources can be can be used to help other people. So I think that if anything, the fact that she's working on that helps her uh, help other people. Yeah, just like the uh, the therapist that you said that was so good in. Savannah, you know, even though he'd been through five divorces, we don't have, we can, we can be a great resource as Patty has been for so many people. And so great reminder. Oh, there, there's the sound of speckling. All right. It's time for the speckle round. There it is. (laughs) Speckle round for our new listeners. I mean, holes, I can get them uh, speckled up here. Your wall's looking fantastic there. So. Yeah. Nicely spackled and painted. Yes. Cool. <laughs> so we're going to fill in some holes for our listeners. All right. So let's start with you, uh, Dr. Steve, have a, a word or phrase of the day that you'd like to share. Well, I always like to uh, leave people with the, uh, on a high note. And I usually say, I hope you have an outstanding day. I love that. Where's that come from? Uh, let's see. I don't know. Where it's just always been there, huh? Well, not yeah, uh, maybe not since I was one or anything, but uh, <laughs> it just seems like maybe it came from, because I usually do it at the end of videos and I make a video, so y- you need to say something, some kind of outro to wrap it up, Yeah. And I, and I was looking for something positive, so I think it came from needing something positive to say at the end of a video, but uh, I, I think it's always appreciated when, when people hear that. Yeah, I love it. I hope you have an outstanding day. Excellent. All right. Another speckle around question. Uh, is there a common belief in your field, Dr. Steve, that you disagree with? Uh, there are a few. Um, 
One that I disagree with is, uh, and I don't necessarily uh, think this is wrong. I just, I just don't know. I haven't seen any research on it. Research in hypnotherapy is usually either not done well or just simply not done. Uh, but the idea that you will drop the word not, like when someone says, and this is so prevalent that I, I usually avoid it anyway, just so I don't send, you know, get anyone uh, you know, riled up by it. But uh, for example, uh, a lot of people think that if I say to a patient, you will not smoke cigarettes, that they drop the not, and all they hear is you will smoke cigarettes. And I hear that quite a bit. Uh, the challenge I have with it is I haven't seen any research uh, that shows that, that, that demonstrates that. Uh, in addition to that, I have some evidence to the contrary, which is when I go to stage hypnosis shows, I have a few friends who do stage hypnosis shows, and they say, you will not remember your first name. And sure enough, the person does not remember their first name. So I, I have an issue with that. That's a minor thing. And I always cater to, you know, although I have an issue with it, I don't make a big deal out of it. And I don't say, you know, I've, I've learned to drop the knot also, just so I don't cause issues. There are other ways to say it, to say that you will not smoke cigarettes uh, without saying the word not. But, uh, you know, not quite, I'm not quite sure how that started, but uh, it did. And I do have an issue with it. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, uh, uh, I appreciate that you um, seek the research, you know, and that uh, you don't just take it for what it is. I mean, for me, I guess it makes sense, you know, in some ways to, to you know, to think, uh, oh, you know, I'm not going to eat cookies. I'm not going to eat cookies that, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about cookies, but that is something different than accepting a suggestion to not eat cookies or to not smoke. Right, right, right. And the, uh, yeah, the whole, I mean, I, I think a lot of people say things that, that they either heard from somewhere else or that sound logical. Right. But I, you know, my doctorate is in education. I'm trained as a researcher and I, I'm just very hesitant to accept things just because somebody said them, you know, if they don't have any research, then uh, I'm just hesitant to, to adopt that. Yeah, I like it. Very good. Some similar uh, long-term or long-held beliefs or myths, uh, unless you correct me, are that uh, habits are uh, set in 21 days. I've heard that was just a term that somebody made up. Uh, yeah, I think that that's probably just maybe the average or something. You know, you, I see a lot about uh, a lot about that. You know, it's it, there's no way that it's just. 21 days exactly for <laughs> oh, one more day and then I've got a new habit <laughs> yeah then I'm all done you know I often recommend listening to an audio for 21 days just because people have heard it so sometimes you can kind of bank on these things you can get someone to, to do something for three weeks because in their mind that's what's going to work so that's hypnotic they've been hypnotically programmed to think that if they listen to something for three weeks it's going to cause change okay count me in I'm going to go with that Yep. And similarly, uh, 10,000 steps, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> great thing. number. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if we have got all these people walking, I have friends who, uh, you know, Oh, I haven't got my 10,000 steps in here. Let me go walk this. I'll take the stairs now and said, okay, great. You know, you're probably going to live longer. There's probably nothing magical about 10,000, but it seems like a good idea. We know that if you, if you walk every day, if you get that exercise every day, it's, it's going to benefit you. So, so, hey, why not? Let's sure. Let's go with 10,000. Yeah, let's go for it. Excellent. Uh, before we clicked record, um, we were in a little bit of a conversation about another belief that perhaps you, you don't agree with um, about training. Do you mind expanding on that? Well, hypnosis training. I've always, uh, you know, hypnosis, in my opinion, the way I teach it, it's very straightforward. And I've been teaching it for a long time. Uh, it's just, uh, I teach it in five parts. You've got an induction deepening uh, script, amnesia. If you got the, the induction is the first part, then the deepening is where you intensify that. The script is where you're programming them. Then, then amnesia, where you're causing them to consciously forget the subconscious programming. Then the fifth part is transtermination, where you're bringing them out of the script, out of the uh, hypnosis session if they're in your office and they've got to go. 
uh, or you tell them to go to sleep if it's you know listening to it at nighttime. Uh, so that's just the way I teach it. So my my concern is not that because I know there are different ways to teach that. There are different ways to parse up a hypnosis session. But my issue is when you have hypnosis schools that are you know two years long or something like that, you know a year long or two years long, and they're teaching all kinds of things in addition to hypnosis. And I believe the reason they're doing that is because that they want the consumer to feel they're getting a lot of value, a lot of bang for their buck. Um, and sometimes I've also seen a school, I, you know, I won't name any names, but uh, that, that meets the minimum number of re, uh, required hours in order for a student to be able to take a loan to go to that school. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I see things, and what I see is uh, the hypnosis schools adding in things that are not necessary in hypnosis and are trying to be like a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a social worker. And I think hypnotherapists, hypnotists, whatever you want to call them, and hypnosis schools just need to, uh, you know, tone it down and realize that hypnosis is very simple. It's kind of like an oil change. You know, when you go to get an oil change, you're, it's a very simple process. You're, in hypnosis, basically, you're changing the, the subconscious mind's, uh, you know, dirty oil and putting some better stuff in there. You're not doing all this other stuff. You know, you, you don't need to wash the windows and do the tires. You can do all that. You can add on all this stuff and you can charge more for it. And it seems like they're learning a lot more. Uh, but, you know, I, I just consider it to be completely unnecessary, uh, misleading to the, the students. And it also causes people to, you know, when they get out of school, uh, those schools, and they have all this stuff, they feel less competent because they've, you know, they've learned all this stuff, kind of, and they feel that hypnosis is this big, overpowering body of knowledge. Yeah, it's just all this stuff. Oh, my God, how am I going to get all this right? No, hypnosis is just you're putting someone into a trance, you're telling them they're going to change, and you're bringing them out. So, you know, I just think hypnotherapists and hypnosis schools need to get over themselves and realize, you know, what they're really doing. They're teaching, a, in most cases, a non uh, it's a non-degree program. It's just a certificate. It's not a college degree. Um, they, you know, they make it sound like it's going to be some kind of, you know, college degree where maybe you'll get state certification or something like that. And, uh, and then I see these schools getting, uh, you know, certified by the state, uh, whatever state they're in and bragging about that. You know, that's nice. You got certified as a school. I could teach basket weaving and get certified by the state. <laughs> teach basket weaving. It doesn't mean anything. So I, I just see people making just this thing bigger and more confusing than it has to be. Yeah. And I see that a lot as well. And I think that's where a lot of the um, paralysis comes in for recent trainees. You know, uh, they read, they hear about this and I think a couple of keywords, uh, ethics and scope of practice come in to recognizing yes. what you're trained for, you know, what we are really doing. And, and your analogy of the oil change, I like it. It's, it's like, well, we, you know, we're, we're, we're just putting in new oil, you know, a new filter. We don't need to know how that those contaminants got in there. You know, what road did we drive down that was so dusty that our oil got so dirty? Yeah. Exactly. We, we've got people we can refer out to. That's another thing, you know, refer out to a psychologist, refer out to a psychiatrist, refer out to a marriage and family therapist. And the scope, and that's another thing we'll have once we have standardization of credentials, we'll have, you know, what is the scope? So right now we're kind of in the wild, wild west. Like, we don't know what the scope is because the government hasn't defined it. There's nothing limiting it in, in most cases, in most states, at least in the United States. Once we have the scope will know what's inside and what's outside. Right now, it's just, you know, here's hypnosis, and they just brought in whatever they felt like bringing in in that particular school to make that student feel like, oh, this is a good school. It's going to teach me all this extra stuff. Yep. Not necessary. And then when they're done, they're overwhelmed, thinking, oh, my God. Yeah. They've got a lot of debt. They're overwhelmed. They, they don't feel they're competent in it. And the, the school has, in many cases, weakened them. Yeah. Very good. Thanks for sharing that. I like that. Sure. Thank you. All right. Another speck around question. Um, is there something that you don't believe now that you thought you always would? <laughs> Astrology. 
I don't know if that's not really about hypnosis. Well, you know, it is. I wrote an art, a blog article recently that astrology is just hypnosis because I used to see, you know, I know about astrology. I know which sign acts like what. And I, I thought, wow, that's really consistent. You know, for something that's kind of doesn't really have much scientific backing, it's, it's fairly consistent. Why is that? Well, now I believe it's because of what Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point and some other awesome books, yep. what he calls nominative determinism, where your name determines what you become. A lot of people named Dennis become dentists. You know, people, uh, there's some guy, I think his last name is Stockman. He's, uh, he's always on the news talking about stocks. You know, we see that a lot. We see people <laughs> with that name and they go into what that name is. And I believe it's the same thing with astrology. You're not an Aquarius or, or what have you because, you know, you're born on a certain date. You're acting that way because you've read that you're supposed to act that way. And you've essentially been hypnotized into believing you're supposed to act that way. So that's my current theory of astrology. Uh, I always thought I would believe in it, but now I, I think I've got to figure it out. And I, I think I'm right, but you know, subject to change life is long. I'll, I'll keep you posted. Do some more research. Yep. Excellent. Good. Very good. All right. Um, if you had a get out of jail card, just a little card that had a, a quote, a word, a phrase that would help you kind of get out of, your, out of your own way. I know you said, you know, life is good right now. I figured a lot of things out, but uh, is there any a little uh, reminder phrase you need every now and then to kind of bring you back to uh, peace and joy? Uh, it, it's just that idea that it's, it's not about me. Um, it's about, uh, it's about helping others. I, I think that's a, a big one. Um, I, I've gotten pretty good at it, but I'm human, so I haven't totally mastered it, but just the idea of the, the outward focus. And as we mentioned, as we talked about earlier, those are the people who are going to last, who are going to stand the test of time, who can really keep, keep giving, keep giving, keep giving. Uh, there was a little, there was a time around 2011 when I was on the millionaire matchmaker and Bravo's below deck and be, you know, being written up in magazines and stuff where it shifted, you know, I was no longer about what can I give is about, Hey, well, I guess I am a celebrity and a really cool guy. We'll just go with that for our branding. Look how cool I am. You know, and now I've come back down to earth and I've realized, Hey, that's not what people want. They don't really care about, you know, what I'm having for breakfast or what city I'm in this week. They care about what I can do for them and, and how I can help them. So for me, that's it. Just coming, always coming back to that. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's a great reminder. And from your perspective, I appreciate that. Yeah. Being on those shows, you know, whether it's those or anything else, I could see where it's a, it's a great way to get the spotlight, but once it's on you, you know, they really want to know, you know, what's, how can you help them? Right. Right. And that's how it got on me anyway. And that's what I tell people, you know, don't go chasing publicity, let publicity chase you. And if it doesn't, that means you're not contributing enough to the world because if you are, they will find you. And that's how it worked for me. And then I started to lose sight of that. I thought, well, I'll just focus on myself. And then, you know, that, that doesn't make you feel good. And that doesn't serve the public anymore. So, yeah, that's for me, that's, that's what it's all about, maintaining that, that outward focus. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. So, and I, I do have to ask you, how did, how did it happen that you ended up on those shows? Uh, two of my favorite shows. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, I, uh, I turned my mom onto Below Deck, too. We're, uh, we're going on a, a Mediterranean cruise uh, next year, and, and I'm like, Mom, you got to watch this. You can see the sights. And, so go yeah. ahead. Uh, uh, they, were just, they just reached out to me and said, you know, we could, uh, you know, we'd like to have you on there. And uh, at first I said, I just thought it was ridiculous, actually. The idea of, you know, going on the Millionaire Matchmaker was the first one. I thought that just sounds kind of silly. I'm not really that kind of guy. I don't really want to. And I was single, but <clears throat> still, I didn't want to go on that TV show and air all my dirty laundry and have someone help me and, you know, do therapy with me in public and all that on TV. Uh, next week, I was on a plane flying to Los Angeles, so I, uh, I realized that that could probably help. And, and initially, I, I went into that with the intention of getting help. And Patty and I have become good friends since then. We've created a number of programs together, along with another friend of mine, Joe Vitale from The Secret uh, we've created programs for people tapping into their millionaire uh, mindset. So that came uh, out of it. Didn't end up getting married or have a long-term relationship. Got a number of dates because of it, because, you know, women seeing me on the show. So that, that kind of helped a little bit. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's how that happened, them uh, reaching out and, you know, just needing someone to, 
to be on there and I happened to fit the bill. Awesome. And then uh, did Below Deck come because of Millionaire Matchmaker? I think so. Uh, Below Deck, I was on the, the first episode of the first season. Um, I don't recall the details of how or why that happened. They reached out to me, but I don't, I don't know if I ever knew how, but I, I think that that's why it happened because sure. I was making, you know, I was, had this public persona at this point somewhat because of the, the first show. So I think that's how that happens. Excellent. Good. Would you go, would you do anything like any of those again? I would. It's more stressful than you might think. Uh, the Millionaire Matchmaker was rather stressful for me. I'm really not a, uh, an extrovert. I'm an introvert. And so being in a, a room with 30 women or 15 women or however many it was who were vying for my attention, I, I actually got kind of weak in the knees, literally, not just the expression. I literally had to, what I learned in military school, when we're standing at uh, attention, you have to bend your knees a little bit so you don't faint. I found myself bending my knees because here was all this attention and all this you know, pressure. Pick one of these beautiful women to be yours. And then we went surfing and I'm not a, I had never surfed before. I didn't do very well surfing. So I found it very stressful. But, but overall, I think what it's done in terms of helping me personally in my branding, that's been good, but also in getting the word about hypnosis out there, I think it's done a lot of good. So, so I definitely would do uh, both of those again. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. Our, uh, our friend, uh, Dr. Richard Nongard, uh, um, had mentioned, I, I told him I'd have a project around uh, sensitive leadership. You know, and I've got a, a book floating in my head about um, sensitive leadership, interviewing leaders who are sensitive. And, hmm. and, uh, and he mentioned you, you know, what a great leader you are and more, uh, whether or not you uh, label yourself as sensitive, introverted as you just did. Yeah, I'd say I'm sensitive and introverted. I'd say I'm infer- introverted because I'm sensitive. If I'm around too many people too too often, it just kind of overwhelms me. So I'll do it in uh, like the thing that we went to, Hypno Thoughts, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, I'll go to that once a year, and it's it's a three day commitment to uh, you know. And I, I make myself available. I hang out with the folks. I'll go to the bar afterwards, and you know where everyone else is hanging out, just to be you know a regular Joe, just to, you know. Here I am. Let's. I'm a human too, uh, but that that does take its toll, and I have to go kind of back into my my uh, reclusive cave and uh, you know decompress after that. I'm I'm right there with you. In fact, I was talking with a few other uh, hypnotherapists at the conference about that. It's there's so much great stuff uh, between the learning and the networking and this and the socializing, but a lot of us need that retreating and uh, retreat to recover. Yeah, some people uh, who I was talking to there, they do that all the time. I mean, they go around, do it's just they love it. They just eat it up, and they they want it, they need it, they they thrive off it. You know, not me. Um, you know, that's the only hypnosis uh, convention I do on a yearly basis because I believe in Scott Sandland and what he's doing, and uh, I I just you know I, I'm I'm giving a lot and it's taking a lot from me at the same time, so I have to sort of limit that stuff balance it out yeah. yeah well i know i know you do offer a lot there it's great having you among all the other great presenters well thanks great having you there too yeah so i, I want to respect our time and our deadline so let's uh let's wrap things up um but before we do um do you have a uh, a request or anything you'd like to offer our listeners sure i have a, a free audio a free hypnosis audio and I think people might like that. It's on building wealth, tapping into your, your inner millionaire, reprogramming your subconscious mind to, to bring forth your gift, whatever it may be, you know, painting, writing, who knows what it is, to, to develop it and to monetize it. And it's a hypnosis audio that programs you to do that. I have that free for your listeners. It's available at my website, which is Steve G. Jones, G as in Gregory, stevegjones.com. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks for that offer. I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes okay. and, and uh, tapping into your inner millionaire. I love it. I love it. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that uh, gift to our, to our listeners and thanks for your time and all that you do for the community. Appreciate it, Dr. Steve. Hey, Rick, thank you. Thanks for making this possible and thanks for reaching out to me and I'm honored to be here. Thanks. M- much appreciated. 